What is up? Welcome back. Today, we're talking seven science-backed ways you can boost your metabolism. As I feel like I've started every video I've shared recently, this is actually a follow-up to a previous video, actually several previous videos where we did deep dives on the science behind the science of metabolism, going over the basics of how your metabolism works, metabolic damage or adaptation, reverse dieting, all that jazz. So I will link those videos down below. But today, I wanted to share a very applied version of these videos breaking down the science explaining steps you can take there has been drama in the carbicide as i'm just <laughs> okay they're gone explaining steps you can take to take all that science all that complex stuff we talked about in the previous videos apply it to your life start boosting your metabolism to day. Before we get started, I want to say a huge thank you to Women's Best for partnering with me on today's video. The Women's Best Vegan Protein is my go-to protein powder for baking, smoothies, shakes, really whatever you could think of using a protein powder for, and then some. Each scoop contains over 21 grams of plant-based protein, has a complete amino acid profile, is soy-free, dairy-free, gluten-free, and easy to digest. So if traditional like whey or casein based proteins bloat you, this may be something to consider. Or if you just want the metabolic boosting benefits of consuming a diet higher in protein, I'll put a link to check it out in the description box down below, as well as a code to save you 20% off everything site wide. <laughs> grocery store we are coming up on lunchtime and today we're going to be making some sandwiches now when it comes to the way you eat you can technically eat more to burn more this is the thermic effective food which describes the energy you burn just breaking down and digesting your food so literally after you eat you could just be sitting there you're burning calories digesting what you just ate protein for example has the highest thermic effective food so by eating a higher protein diet by swapping some of your regular ingredients in your meals for something higher protein that can help you burn more calories with the way you regularly eat. sandwich assembly step of our sandwich making. So for today, we have got two loaves of bread. We have got this seven grain bread, as well as your kind of traditional standard white bread. Now, I feel like from a healthy eating standpoint, bread gets no love. It gets so much hate. It gets a really bad rep. But when you're trying to eat to increase the thermic effect of food, a great way by doing this is by making really simple substitutions with some of the carbohydrate sources you're eating for things that are higher fiber. In general, foods that are higher fiber and less processed have a higher thermic effect of food, whereas foods that are lower fiber and more processed have a lower thermic effect of food. So something as simple as like, you don't have to give up bread. It's definitely not necessary to eat healthy. If you just wanna swap your standard white bread for maybe like a whole grain bread, a seven grade bread, a chia bread, look at the nutritional label, look for anything that has a little bit more fiber, that's gonna help you get more out of the foods you're eating. Okay, so sandwiches are made. I also ended up adding some sprouts as well as spinach to my sandwiches to add a little bit more fiber, a little bit more flavor and greenery to what we've got going on here. So I'm gonna dig on in and I will check in with you in a bit when it's time for our workout. Workout time. There are so many ways you can maximize metabolism with your workouts, but first let's address the elephant in the room. One of the most common pieces of advice to boost your metabolism is to build more muscle. But my question to that advice would be, well, how much does it boost your metabolism and how long does it take to boost your metabolism? Because one of the quickest ways to kill your consistency on this fitness journey is by setting expectations that are not aligned with reality. The way that muscle mass affects your metabolism is via BMR 
burner or basal metabolic rate. The calories you burn just sitting, breathing, and existing. As compared to fat, muscle is a more metabolically demanding tissue, so by just existing as a human being with more muscle, you will require more energy to maintain. However, going back to expectations, building muscle is a patient process that is heavily influenced by biological sex, genetics, hormones, training history, and the list goes on. It is easier to build muscle at the start of your fitness journey, and you can expect this to slow down and eventually plateau over time. Now, when it will plateau, the consensus seems to be that after about five years of proper diet and training, you can expect muscle growth progress to slow, but proper diet and training means that you've been doing everything ideally from a muscle building standpoint. So eating enough protein, eating enough carbohydrates, following a properly structured training plan that progresses in difficulty or intensity over time, getting enough sleep, not being at a calorie deficit constantly. Many of us are not doing these things ideally and that is okay. I mean, we don't live in a lab setting, we live in the real world. So the natural genetic potential for biological women tends to be in the range of 20 to 25 pounds of lifetime muscle growth. Whereas for biological men, the natural genetic potential for muscle growth tends to be in the range of 40 to 50 pounds. The reason I keep emphasizing natural is because of course there are substances that you can take that can extend these ranges, but those substances are also illegal. So we will not be talking about them on here. To put this into perspective, muscle burns 13 calories per kilogram per day, whereas fat, a less metabolically demanding tissue, burns about four and a half calories per kilogram per day. Taking the higher end of each of those ranges, so for women, this would be 25 pounds of muscle growth. That is 11.3 kilograms. 11.3 kilograms times 13 calories per kilogram per day, you could burn an extra 147 calories per day. Whereas for men, say that you naturally build 50 pounds of lean muscle, that's 22.7 kilograms. 22.7 times 13 is an extra 295 calories burned per day. While it's not insignificant, remember this is after several years of hard, consistent work to build muscle. So yes, while having more muscle will technically boost your metabolism. It's not by that much in the scheme of things. If you think it's going to just give you the freedom to eat like whatever you want, whenever you want. And today's video is focused on tips that you can start implementing right here, right now. To be honest, the workouts you do to build that muscle are probably going to do more for your metabolism than just having the muscle in and of itself. Because muscle, if you're not moving it or doing anything to maintain it, that's not going to do a lot for your metabolism. So this is why instead of just obsessing over building as much muscle as possible to boost your metabolism, I recommend focusing on lifting challenging weights and or exercising in some other way that gradually progresses in intensity. One way to increase the intensity of your workouts is by doing compound instead of isolation exercises. A compound exercise is an exercise that involves movement about more than one joint. For example, a bent over row involves movement about both the elbow and shoulder joints, whereas an isolation exercise is an exercise that involves movement about one joint, like a bicep curl. If I bend over, you can hopefully see the difference between the bent over row versus the bicep curl. The bent over row, you can see both my lower arm and upper arm moving, whereas with the bicep curl, it's only my lower arm moving because the weight is only moving about the elbow joint. Muscles drive movement about joints, so the more joints involved in a movement, the more muscles required to complete that movement, and the more metabolically demanding the exercise becomes. Another way to increase the intensity of your workouts is by incorporating incorporating supersets. So that's where you do one exercise immediately after the other with no rest in between. Now, not all supersets are created equal. If you don't program them correctly into your workout, they can lead to excessive fatigue, which can hold you back from bringing your best intensity or lifting as heavy as you can. This is why I like supersetting upper body with lower body exercises. So while the upper body is working, the lower body is resting and vice versa. This is often referred to as peripheral heart action training or PHA training. And the reason it's effective is because we're keeping the intensity high from a heart pumping standpoint while still giving your muscles adequate rest between sets to bring the intensity from a lifting heavy standpoint. Now, I did say that not all supersets or circuits are created equal, especially if they lead to excessive fatigue that keeps you from lifting as heavy. 
However, occasionally there is a time and place where excessive fatigue can be used to your advantage, especially if your goal is muscle building. Drop sets are a technique that involves taking an exercise to the point of temporary failure, dropping the difficulty in some way and repeating for however many drops you want to do. There are many ways to implement drop sets, but the first thing to decide is how many drops you want to do. So every drop is a different set. Let's say that we're doing three drops as part of our drop set. The two main strategies are to do either a mechanical drop set where you would pick three exercises, put the hardest first, then on each drop, adjust the mechanics of the exercise in some way so that it becomes easier. For example, starting with the hardest push-up variation and doing as many reps as you can, dropping to the easier push-up variation, doing as many reps as you can, then dropping to the easiest push-up variation and going till failure. The other strategy would be incorporating loaded drop sets where you pick one exercise but have three sets of weights ready. You lift the heaviest weight for as many reps as you can, drop to the lighter weight, do as many reps as you can, then drop to the lightest weight and take that to failure. The key with drop sets is that you use them sparingly. I would recommend doing these as a finisher at the end of your workout, or if you're training more than one muscle group per workout, do these as the last thing for a particular muscle group. When done correctly, these are very high intensity. They're very taxing on your body. They will make you very sore in the following days. So don't do them all the time. They're just one tool in the tool belt. Once or twice per week should be fine. Like that, we are back. We are having a little snack and we are gonna be working, which we have a lot to do up today. But right now I'm having a little protein shake building off of what we were talking about earlier. Increasing your daily protein intake is a great way to maximize your thermic effect of food, the calories you burn from the food you eat. Now, I'm not normally a protein shake person, so don't think that you need to be pounding back protein shakes at every opportunity you get. My favorite way to increase protein intake is to sneak higher protein ingredients or foods into the meals you already eat. So like with the sandwich I shared earlier with protein powder, like protein powder is such a great tool, but most people think that you can only increase Include it in protein shakes or in smoothies and things like that. I use the Women's Best Vegan Protein. I'm actually using it as my tripod right now, so I will just put it on screen. But my favorite way to use it is in baking. I find baking therapeutic. Of course, I also like eating the end result of what I've baked. But what I realized a couple years back is that you can actually substitute the flour in recipes up to about one third of the amount called for for vegan protein powder. This does not work with whey protein powder. Not all protein powders bake the same. The best one I found to bake with is the Women's Best Vegan Protein. I'll link it down below. I actually just made a recipe for the Women's Best YouTube channel where you can like see how I do this, but it was for protein brownie balls. I'll link that recipe video down below as well as a code to save 20% off everything you get on the Women's Best site. You can use it to support me. You can use it to just save some money you know, do what you want, but that is probably the easiest way to get more protein in your diet. Anyways, I did want to talk about work. My work schedule varies wildly. There are some days where I am very active when I'm doing workout filming, I'm literally moving from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. And then there are other days like today where I am more sedentary and I'm mostly working at my computer, like editing, doing emails, whatever. I'm sitting on my bum and I'm on my computer, which I think if you have a sedentary job, this can feel like a huge barrier to living a more active lifestyle. Research upon research has proven that neat non-exercise activity thermogenesis, the lifestyle component of activity, is the most variable component of metabolism. And as a result of this, when you often see people who have an easier time maintaining their weight, who seemingly have fast metabolisms and can eat whatever they want, more often than not, it's not because they have a ton of muscle mass. It's not because they're eating crazy high protein diets. It's not because they're doing insanely intense workouts. Most of the time, it's because they have very active lifestyles. They're not actually trying, but they just are active in their everyday life. People like construction workers, people who do manual labor, I even seen some like daycare and preschool, like uh, child caregivers, caregivers in general, people who are literally moving themselves as well as other people on the daily. These are very active jobs. And so these people will seemingly have super fast metabolisms, even if they don't work out, but it's because they're moving 24 seven during the day. So if you do work a sedentary job and you're looking for ways to become more active on the daily, I think the standard advice is just get moving, just take the stairs, which I think is kind of useless advice because it's like, well, how do I get moving? When do I get moving? How much should I be moving? Is this like high intensity, 
low intensity, what am I doing? And if I'm taking the stairs, how often, how many flights, like what is the deal? I need specifics. I have my critiques of the Apple Watch, but one thing that this watch gets right is the stand goal, it's under here, is the stand goal reminding you, irritating you to stand up and move around every hour on the hour. You don't need an Apple Watch to do this, all right? You can literally just keep an eye on the clock or set little alarms of your own. And there's no magic in getting up and standing every hour on the hour. It's just really a convenient time frame for most people to get up and move around. And this actually kind of reminds me of, I got really into goal setting and productivity and all of that a few years back, but it really reminds me of what I learned about SMART goals, right? It's SMART is an acronym that stands for specific, measurable, I think it's attainable, either realistic or repeatable. And I think the T is for timely. Correct me down below if I got that wrong. But the whole idea of SMART goals is that if you just go into setting your goals like, I wanna do this. That is so vague and you have no action plan to get there. You don't know how to show up consistently because you've made no plan to show up consistently. Whereas when you are very, very specific with your goals, you say, this is what I'm doing, this is when I'm doing it, this is how often or you know the way in which I'm doing it and this is when it's gonna be done by, that makes it much easier to actually go and do that thing. So the way that I like to be more active on my more sedentary days, that sounds kind of funny, is by doing something called habit stacking. So the idea of habit stacking, another thing I learned about during my productivity obsession is that you take an action or an activity that you want to make a habit and you sandwich it in your schedule between two other things that are either already habits or are non-negotiables in your routine. Like these things are getting done no matter what. So by putting this thing that like maybe you don't wanna get done, maybe you have a tough time getting done, because these things are on either side, you have to get it done because you have to get that second thing done. How much you move, how often you move, the intensity at which you move, that's completely up to you. And I think really the most important thing is that it is easy to do in your existing routine. The key to getting it done consistently is by reducing the perceived difficulty to the point that you're like, oh my gosh, that's so easy. It'd be ridiculous for me not to get this done. So it's not like you have to do a full hit workout between different tasks, but if you are in an office building, take a flight of stairs, take a couple flights of stairs, go up, then come back down, go down, then come back up, you know, whatever is realistic for you. If you're at home, you have a little bit more flexibility with this. You could do some yoga moves, you could do some stretching, you could do some push-ups. say over the course of the day, you're like, okay, I want to get 50 push-ups done today. I'm going to break that up into like 10 push-up chunks and I'm going to intersperse those with my to-do list, right? It's completely up to you, but I think it is important to make it specific and make it something that's easy enough that you can do it consistently. That is it for today's video. I hope you found this video helpful. I do like sprinkling in these more kind of science applied videos where we can just talk like normal people instead of having a million studies on screen and backing up everything we're saying. I mean, not that it's not science back, but you know, it's just sometimes easier when there's not kind of that barrier between what we're trying to communicate and how we're supposed to apply it. Hopefully you get what I mean. So if you find this helpful, definitely shoot me a thumbs up and maybe let me know in the comment section down below which of these habits you're either already implementing, which you maybe learned about today and you're gonna try implementing. I think the most important thing to take from this video or the thing I'd like to emphasize is that you don't have to do this all at once. There are so many little habits that you can incorporate into your daily routine. You can try them on for size, see if they vibe with you, see if they're a good fit, because that really is the key. Reduce the perceived difficulty of what you're doing so that it becomes easy to do consistently. That has been like just understanding that for me. I'm going to pull a number out of thin air, but I would say it's been responsible for at least 80% of my results lately. 80 is a very rough number. I did make that up, but it is such a key mental shift to make. Make fitness easy. Work with your body. It is possible and it is going to make it so much easier for you to get into a consistent routine. I, as always, have got so many videos coming your way, but if there are other kind of science applied topics you just want to hear about from a very practical standpoint, let me know in the comment section down below. As a reminder, I've also included that link to check out the Women's Best Vegan Protein and everything else they have. I wear a lot of Women's Best clothing. I use a variety of their supplements. I'll put that link down below as well as the discount code to save 20% percent off the entire site. The great thing about that code is that it does stack on top of other promos they have going on. So sometimes Women's Best has like a BOGO deal on, sometimes they have like some things that are already marked down. So that's 20% off in addition to whatever else is currently going on on the site. All right, so all that will be down below. Otherwise, thank you for watching and I can't wait to see you in the next video.